Welcome to JAT Chat, presented by the Journal of Athletic Training, the official journal of the National Athletic Trainers Association. I'm Dr. Shelby Baez, an assistant professor in the Department of Exercise and Sports Science at UNC Chapel Hill and co-host of JAT Chat with Dr. Kara Radzak. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Nikki Harris. Dr. Harris is an assistant professor and the director of student recruitment for the Department of Athletic Training at A.T. Sill University. She is co-author of Board of Certification Exam Achievement Gaps as a Barrier to Diversifying the Athletic Training Profession. Nikki, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so we'll we'll just jump right into it. So what do we know about current racial and ethnic diversity in the athletic training profession? You know, simply put, it, it's lacking. It is severely lacking. I think we know that anecdotally, just in our everyday interactions with other athletic trainers and other athletic training educators, that, you know, there's the lack of diversity as a whole, um, but particularly racial and ethnic diversity. Um, you know, the numbers also don't lie at that. Over 80% of athletic trainers identify as non-Hispanic white, um, and it kind of goes the same for our student population, um, which is really in the 70s, which is not too much better. So we know that it really does not reflect the overall diversity of our country as a nation, um, and it really, really doesn't reflect that diversity of the patients that we typically seem to serve. So, Yeah, and Definitely. And I think about my own experience as a person of color. I was the only person of color in my professional cohort, as well as my post, post-professional cohort. Um, so definitely, anecdotally, we, we had a lot to, to work to do, but it seems like the numbers also align there as well. Yeah. Um, so the purpose of this paper was to examine achievement gaps between ethnicity and first time and retake pass rates for the BOC. So can you just talk to us a little bit about what was the catalyst to examine this particular question? Yeah, so this was actually probably, it came up just in my everyday interaction. So prior to working at AT Still, uh, I spent six years working as both a preceptor and a professor for a professional level program, uh, particularly an entry level master's or professional master's program. I was thankful enough to work at a minority serving institution. So the diversity of our particular program was significantly higher than those probably across the country. Um, However, in my interactions, I started to notice that as the second year students were approaching the BOC and coming from the BOC, uh, a few of them weren't passing. So again, we were very diverse. Um, Overall, we had a very good pass rate um, and we were kind of historically known for that. However, it came to my attention like year after year that when that one student or maybe two students wouldn't pass on that first attempt, that it always seemed to happen to be an ethnic minority student. Um, and then particularly, to be honest, an African-American student, um, being a female of color myself, I started to notice like, hmm, this is strange. You know, every time it happens to this one student, I'm noticing this pattern. So probably, I'd say it probably went on for about three or four years before it really clicked to me that, you know, this was a pattern. So it was kind of my own interest of determining, was this kind of an issue that was only in our program, or is this something that is occurring across the nation or across athletic training programs? Um, And for us, we were also an entry-level master's program um, for a little bit longer than others. So it was also a question to me, is this something that's kind of happening at the entry-level master's um, or just generally in athletic training. So it kind of came out of my own passion project, I would say, um, and kind of from that same anecdotal evidence and wanting to, I guess, create a theory around that or or prove it wrong. Yeah, and I think what is uh, amazing about what you said is that um, similar, I think some of the best research projects come from our own anecdotal experiences. And we see something that's happening and it's the catalyst for us to actually need to do it to want to do something, to, to change something. Um, so there's this concept of an achievement gap. Can you just provide some context for our listeners of what is achievement? How did you all define achievement in this study? Absolutely. So we felt like achievement was a good word. Obviously, achievement can be defined in a variety of different ways as it comes to education. Um, but we felt like in athletic training, the the board of certification exam really serves as like the ultimate measure of success. 
um, when it comes to students coming out of their professional program. Essentially, you have to pass the BOC exam before you can truly enter our profession. Um, so we felt like regardless of the achievement that a student obtained throughout their program, whether it be, you know, good preceptor reviews or a good GPA, essentially, regardless of those factors, they had to pass the BOC in order to enter the profession. Uh, so the purposes, for the purposes of this study, we defined achievement as success on the BOC exam. And we looked at that either on the first attempt, um, which is a common measure, obviously, across the KD, but then as well as overall. Um, in all students. So we really wanted to use that specifically as our kind of operational definition. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense uh, with a credentialing exam that uh, ultimately before you can practice as an athletic trainer, you should be able to pass the BOC. You will really have to pass the BOC. So just jumping right into the results here. So what did you all find as it relates to achievement gaps between Caucasian and ethnic minority groups in athletic training? Yes, yeah, so I think as a researcher, and it, you always kind of come up with a theory, right, or hypothesis for any study. And, you know, the fun part of research, I think, is when you're correct or when you find something surprising with that. Um, so I will say we weren't shocked by the results, but we'll, we really felt that some of the disparities that we found were really quite alarming. Um, so prior to my study, you know, I spoke with William Adams, who also performed a study um, in the GAT before who looked at only the results within his program. So we're kind of getting an idea that this might be something that was happening in other programs as well. Um, so once we were able to kind of look at programs as a whole and take that data from the BOC, we found that essentially white students are most likely to pass the exam. So white students have a first time pass rate of about 93% um, compared to Hispanic students, which are a little bit lower at about 87%, um, and then followed by African-American students were at a lowest percentage um, of 75% on that first pass rate. So we felt, you know, the difference between groups was pretty alarming um, when we started to kind of put it in that statistical context. Um, we also kind of found that similarities extended to overall pass results. Um, so we still found that obviously white students were more likely to pass even when they did have to take some subsequent attempts on the exam. Um, Hispanic students fared a little bit better, but then we found that African-American students especially were also having this really difficult time passing on their subsequent um, attempts on the exam. Um, so we really just kind of felt that was extremely alarming. Um, it was really one of the first studies to identify that in such a large group of participants. So uh, we, we were pretty floored about that and felt it needed to get out there to the general public. Yeah, so some very clear differences between groups in your study. So I'm going to ask the, the tough question here is why? Why do you, what are potentially some barriers for ethnic minority groups successfully passing the VOC? You know, it's, I wish it was a simple fix, uh, but like most issues in diversity, equity, and inclusion, it, it's not. Um, I think Barriers are extremely multifactorial, and we're also looking at this in a post-COVID world, or we like to think post-COVID world. Um, so there are some things related to the digital divide. Um, a lot of times students that come from ethnically diverse or traditionally marginalized populations have a little bit less access to digital tools for learning. Um, so whether that be stable internet connections or highly functioning technology, whether it be phones, computers that kind of help with their studying for the exam and their general preparation throughout their program. Um, obviously, we also have a kind of economic and structural divide. So making sure that ethnic minority students have those suitable study spaces, um, whether that means transportation to their local library or their campus library, a more adequate study space at home, uh, and then also adequate learning resources. So obviously economics comes in there when it comes to preparing, making sure that you have, you know, the textbooks that you need and the study guides that you need. Um, and some of if even the prep courses that are a little bit more expensive that we find that traditionally marginalized populations have a little bit more accessibility to those resources. Um, other things just come to like home environment, right? Um, a lot of times ethnic minority students are also going to have to work um, or have some type of employment aside from that. So that usually takes up a little bit more of their time and energy um, and obviously leaving some, some grogginess or some sleepiness around creating that valuable study time. Um, so those are just kind of some of those 
some of those barriers. One of the other things that we discussed in the paper a little bit was kind of the stress and anxiety, um, specifically related to stereotype threat. Um, and we really feel like that comes into play, especially on those retake exams. So really identifying and knowing that their peers from other ethnic minority groups are kind of stereotyped for not being as able to successfully pass that exam or not being as smart or some of those other factors. You know, there's a fear, I think, in every ethnic minority student, whether it's conscious or unconscious, um, of kind of living up to that stereotype that others place on them. Um, so, you know, I think when I look back at my own, I was blessed to pass on that first time, but there is no doubt that there is some unconscious bias, I think, for every student, particularly at the graduate level of understanding the pressures of being successful, um, not only for themselves, but for the others that they represent within their community. Yeah, and I can also express a similar amount of pressure uh, when I think about taking my, my border certification exam. But I also think about just practical examinations in our program. And I remember personally, prior to my first practical exam, um, I was extremely stressed out to the point where I felt like I was going to have to have a panic. I was going to have a panic attack because of all of these different stressors that I was concerned about. Um, so one thing you started to allude to was this concept of differences between maybe first time test takers versus second time test takers. Are there any specific differences that you identified or are these barriers, do they look fairly similar across the groups? You know, I think they are fairly similar across the groups. Again, I think African-Americans are, are a little bit more predisposed or at risk for some of those barriers. I think the problem that comes in with retake exams is that things become amplified, right? So the stereotype threat becomes amplified, um, particularly the economic disparity becomes amplified because as students need additional attempts, they have to pay for additional attempts, they have to pay for additional study materials, and they're also approaching the end of their program. Um, so that looks like being behind and obtaining um, employment or transitioning to actual practice. Um, it looks like student loans, they're obviously coming around the corner for them to pay. So that economic aspect seems to apply a significant more amount of pressure um, to kind of pass the exam as quickly as possible. So, you know, the results that we found, Hispanic students were probably the ones that, that looked the best. So on their retake exam, they were a little bit closer to Caucasian students in terms of being able to pass on subsequent attempts. Um, but for, for African-American students, especially you find that the more attempts that they take, you know, the more difficult it becomes to pass that exam. And does this seem to be a unique issue to athletic training or how does this align with potentially other healthcare professions? You know, I don't know that it's a good thing because we hate to see disparities anywhere, but, you know, it is somewhat comforting to know that this is not abnormal. Um, it aligns very much with certification um, or credentialing exams across the healthcare professions. Um, so, you know, nursing a lot of times aligns with a lot of the research that we do in athletic training. Um, so, you know, it's been established in nursing and pharmacy, um, even in PT and PA. Um, so it is not uncommon that they suffer from diversity as a whole in the profession and that the credentialing exam is kind of one of those barriers um, that's that makes it difficult for diverse individuals to enter the profession. You know, it also extends, you know, there's a multitude of research on achievement gaps, particularly, um, and it extends to other things such as law and teaching as well. Um, it, it really goes back to the foundation of standardized testing as a whole um, and making sure that we kind of have those those equitable practices in the exam and then also in the resources that prepare for students for the exam. So it, it, it is comforting, but it's also concerning that across our healthcare um, providers, we're seeing a similar um, trend as it relates to these achievement gaps. So I, I think my, my next question, probably one of the the most convoluted questions is what do we do about it? How can we start to better diversify athletic training? How can we make the BOC more equitable across racial and ethnic minority groups? What can we do? That's always the, the burning question, right? Um, <laughs> and, and I think we are already, I will acknowledge the strides of kind of the strategic alliance as well as individuals and individual programs. So I do think we are on by all means on the right track to doing a better job with that. But obviously there, there's a lot of room to go. 
Uh, so it's really multifactorial. Like I said, this is probably the first study of its kind in athletic training. Um, however, I don't think this is brand new information to the board of certification, um, potentially just the way that it's been reported. Um, so they've been actively working already to kind of make strides to improve the exam, to look at the question item writing, um, and they've created their own committees around diversity, equity, and inclusion that are looking at some of that from an actual content um, and delivery process of the exam. So that is obviously with good intention. Um, I think many athletic training programs have also, with good intention, sought to kind of implement some more rigorous preparation methods for the BOC. Um, to help them prepare. One of my biggest things with that is just understanding the difference between equal and equitable resources. Um, I think that still becomes a challenge for both our students and our program administrators to truly understand what implementation of equitable resources looks like. Um, and I think that goes into recruitment and retention as well, right? Because there's been a big push to recruit more diverse students into the programs. Um, however, sometimes we fail to give those diverse students the resources that they need once they're in there, right? We're, we're kind of creating these very rigorous methods of, of preparing students for the BOC. However, those methods look very equal across the program, um, you know, so I think some of that needs to go to the education of program administrators about, you know, what do equitable resources truly look like? Um, how do we identify those maybe at-risk populations, not only just looking at the race and ethnicity, but other socioeconomic or kind of social determinants of learning that put certain students at risk and then understanding how to disperse the resources that we do have um, as equitably as possible. So in my opinion, that's probably one of the biggest things that I think we need to push forward and doing in our profession to kind of help, help equal the disparity that's there now. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of more harm than good if we're bringing these diverse students into our program, but then not preparing them um, successfully, right? And I think by giving them those resources, it's beneficial to the students, it's beneficial to diversifying the profession, um, but it's also beneficial to programs um, and their like accreditation outcomes. So we did touch a little bit on that um, in regards to previously standard six and seven from Katie kind of looked at your BOC pass rates. Um, and there was a fear that kind of by putting this information out there, it would deter programs from taking ethnic minority students in there and knowing that they'd be less likely to pass the exam. Um, so, you know, since this study has been published, we're happy to report that Katie has kind of changed the requirements around standard six and seven um, to kind of provide some equity and some room for improvement in that process. So again, there's a lots of great things underway in all of the branches of the Strategic Alliance. Um, you know, for me, I think from an individual program perspective, it's really going to be learning about those equitable resources. Yeah, and I think when reading the, the article, there was this term, like a colorblind approach to education. Um, can you just, uh, you already alluded to what this meant, but can you, for our, our readers who may not understand or uh, uh, understand what a colorblind approach means, can you just provide a little bit more context, uh, context there? Yeah, it goes back again to that equality versus equity thing, right? So when we take a colorblind approach, we kind of take the approach that we're going to treat all the students within our program equally. We're going to provide them, you know, with somewhat equal opportunities for clinical sites and equal opportunities for textbooks or learning resources or equal, you know, opportunities for whatever it may be within your program, which, it, you know, ideally I think is very well intended. We essentially want to think as good hearted individuals that we're providing everybody with what they need. Um, and I think it takes out that approach of diversity, right? What, what brings to the table is the differences that people have. And a lot of that is their prior <clears throat> learning experiences. So I think we need to see that color per se, right? And understand that the differences and the experiences that each student brings to the program and what their individual needs might be. Um, we kind of, titled it at ATSU, learner-centered care as well, because we think so much about patient-centered care as athletic trainers and how we need to look at the individual experiences of the patient and their individual needs. And it, it's really no different in education, right? These students all bring former experiences in regards to education, um, in regards to their social determinants, and it is 
crucial for their success that we look at those individual differences and think about how our education or how our curriculum or how our actual instruction and delivery needs to be modified um, to meet the student more where they're at. And I think that's particularly true at the professional master's level um, as we kind of elevate our education requirements. I absolutely love that term, learner-centered care. And as I'm thinking, as an educator myself and thinking about how can I enhance my own practices, that's something that I'm going to take with me from, from just this conversation with you. Um, so what are the next steps for future research in this space? <laughs> you know, there there's a couple of different avenues that you can go. I, I mean, I think this could be an arm of my research in general, if you say that. Um, I think for me, there's a few things. So one thing that we found interesting, both Lindsay and I, is that when we looked at the racial and ethnic demographics that were reported, because they're self-reported to the BOC when you take the exam, uh, we found a really significant portion of people who did who chose not to identify their race or ethnicity. Um, and you also, as a person of color, I would imagine have at some point in your life questioned whether you wanted to put your race or ethnicity um, on a legal document or on a document that had standing on a decision of some sort, right? So I'm very curious to see, you know, what's the reasoning behind that? I, I know as a person myself that I, I would have to stop and think about it um, to wonder if there would ever obviously be any undue ramifications of that, right? We, we would assume that everything runs as it should, um, but there is a fear, I think, for all ethnic minorities that there could be some backlash there, right? Um, so for me, I would love to kind of look at the mistrust that surrounds that, um, you know, and why that is and how we can possibly improve that, because I think it's really important to have that type of information. Um, as we grow our body of research and diversity, equity, inclusion. So that that is one avenue. Um, another avenue kind of goes at, for me, looking at the psychosocial health of individuals that do fail on their first attempt, because um, we've kind of talked about that stereotype threat. Um, and some of those things, in other studies and other fields, there's been a lot of reports of anxiety and depression that occur from individuals that fail on that first attempt um, and how to kind of rectify that to ensure we get those individuals in our profession and they're not they're not lost um, before they ever get in. So those are two things. I think for me, the biggest thing I will say or where I'd like to focus my research on in the future is really going to be looking at the social determinants of learning. So again, kind of mirroring off patient-centered health, mirroring off the social determinants of health, um, because so many social and environmental factors feed into what drives us as learners. So I think it's really important that we do some research there around the individual student and kind of what perhaps what social determinants most facilitate learning within athletic training programs or passing the BOC, um, but then also ones that are, are detrimental or serve as barriers to our students so that we can really try to tailor some resources there um, to better understanding those problems. Because I think those are the large issues that will help drive diversity in the profession as a whole. Um, over some of the smaller initiatives. It's gotta be kind of a combination of really big level uh, initiatives as well as kind of grassroots things that happen at the programmatic level. And I'm, I'm sure I can speak for a lot of uh, the listeners right now. I think we're all excited to see that work uh, come out. So we'll make sure we continue to follow uh, the work that you're putting out as, as you're uh, continuing your own research line. So can you provide a, a take home point about your paper for our listeners. If there's one thing that you want our listeners to, to get from uh, listening to this podcast today, what would that be? Absolutely, I will not stand on my soapbox. I will keep it concise. Uh, I think the diversity of the athletic training profession essentially hangs on the ability of our ethnic minority students to pass the BOC exam. Um, and, and that's just facts. So in order to facilitate that, I think we have to do a better job of identifying at-risk students, again, racial and ethnicity or for other reasons, and then apply those resources equitably um, at the programmatic level. Um, and just kind of keeping in mind that the, the success of the ethnic minority student is really the success of all of us within the profession. Um, so just kind of keeping that at the forefront of our minds. Absolutely. Well, Nikki, thank you so much for joining me today. 
And this article is available free of charge by the Journal of Athletic Training. I highly recommend everyone go and download this current manuscript available now online first on the Journal of Athletic Training. Again, thank you so much, and we will see you next time.